So, good evening or afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this very special lecture event by Marek Desa from the University of Auckland, New Zealand. And um, I will just introduce Marek shortly. Uh, he is Senior Lecturer and Associate Dean International at the Faculty of Education and Social Work at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. And Marek's research is focused on philosophical methods, childhood studies, and early childhood education, with expertise in the philosophy of education and childhood. And his research is concerned with the construction of childhoods, notions of place and space, and methodological and philosophical thinking around ontologies and the ethics of research in these notions. And we are bringing Marek here together with the Performing Arts Research Center, with Serada, you know Serada, say hello, and a degree program in dance pedagogy. And I'm hosting this talk today. My name is Eva Ankela. I warmly welcome you. It's really great to see so many of you here. It's a very timely topic. And yes, welcome. And thank you, Marek. Please. Thank you so much, Eva. Thank you so much, Eva, for this uh, lovely introduction and for your hospitality and generosity and for uh, for having me over here. And thank you so much for uh, for coming to um, hear this talk, um, which is titled "Posthumanism, New Materialism, and Philosophy as a Method: Dreams and Possibilities for Postcodative Inquiry in Arts and Education." And as most of the work when it comes to philosophical and methodological and post-qualitative scholarship. It's very much work in progress, and I'm looking forward to uh, delivering this paper to you and then to have a discussion about these um, issues um, that I'm going to propose in this paper. Um, for many years in the 20th century, Western philosophical and methodological thinking has been defined against the background of Cartesian dualisms. And it was this Cartesian thinking of separating the discursive and material that the philosophy of the subject, of the human eye, gave birth to the postmodern era and in the recent years to the notions that we tend to call new materialisms and new posthumanisms. It was modernity and its ruins that gave birth to ideas of rewriting the human self and now the posthuman eye. As cultural critic Greenberg argues, the essence of modernism lies in its use of characteristic methods of a discipline to criticize the discipline itself, not in order to subvert it, but in order to, en to entrench it more firmly in its area of competence. Immanuel Kant used logic to establish the limits of logic, and while he withdrew much from its old jurisdiction, logic was left all the more secure in what there remained to it. The philosophy of the eye of the subject takes different philosophical forms in response to different historical and cultural contexts. The humanistic tradition, which our fields and disciplines has inherited, and in philosophy constitutes a form of pedagogy rather than a coherent philosophy, and is preoccupied with the process of character formation in relation to the speaking and writing subject. The notion of the self as a subject, as the source of subjective experiences, consciousness, and feelings, has thus become a central term in the modern continental tradition in debates of a human autonomy. It draws on the new forms of German idealism, with Kant and Hegel as they respond to Hume's radical skepticism regarding the self as a bundle of perceptions. Hegel, like the idealist traditional philosophers, believes that consciousness of objects necessarily implies some awareness of self as a subject, which is separates from the perceived object. Furthermore, Hegel takes the idea of self-consciousness a step further and asserts that subjects are also objects to other subjects, as formulated in his master-slave dialectic writing, and the self can become a negation of others, perceived as a struggle for recognition implied in self-consciousness. So within this modern continental tradition, it was the Cartesian world in arts and education that kept qualitative inquiry united both politically and in terms of the order and ontology of arrangements. Against its will, it also helped to strengthen post-qualitative inquiry 
to cultivate and redevelop its time-tested principles and practices like research methods, conceptual frameworks, ethics, and the concepts of subject-object of the research. Post-qualitative research, confronted by the gloomy, dangerous, and expansionist world of traditionalism and homogeneity, machinistic repetition and treatment of data in the public discourses of dissertation and the academy, made post-qualitative researchers continually strive to prove their commitment and on the surface and in some real commitments to idiosyncrasy, entanglements, and post-humanism in education. In other words, traditional qualitative inquiry was instrumental in the post-qualitative self-affirmation. This self-affirmation is visible in both philosophy as a method and the way that it rewrites or debrides the subject, and in particular post-human subjectivity in the time of the Anthropocene. Yet in a way, the human subject I has a rather equivocal self-affirmation. There is something soothing about it, while stimulating many good things. It has also led Western art and educational discourse to, unwitting, to unwittingly embrace certain stereotypes that grew from feeling of its own status as beyond question. The non-time and non-history of the human eye infected the West and Western arts based in educational research. Qualitative researchers became too used to, too comfortable with, the bipolar division of the subject object into blocks based on power and ideology, individualism, enlightenment, and humanism. They became too used to the status quo of 20th century academia and to things staying pretty much the way they were. But as the linguistic turn torpedoed the calm waters of arts and education, the whole qualitative Cartesian landscape had exploded and in a rather frenzied fashion collapsed in upon itself. In its place, a crater has suddenly opened up before the eyes of astonished researchers, one that is still spewing forth a lava stream of post and new prefixes and surprises. Mixed up in this lava, one can find the long-forgotten history coming back to haunt us, a history full of thousands of economic, social, ethical, ethnic, territorial, cultural, and political concerns that had remained latent, dormant, and unnoticed under the surface of Cartesian boredom. This boredom is so familiar, even nowadays, to qualitative research scholarship. However, ever since the challenge to the human eye and philosophy of the subject entered qualitative research, and the schooling of young researchers in universities, I have begun to hear expressions of nostalgia for the days when the research was, was much easier to understand. Despite the fashion of rewriting, debriting the post-human eye, there are traces of humanism and particular language and scholarship that determines belonging to a particular genre and person. I often struggle to conceptualize and articulate that problem or complexity of researchers dealing with all these dreams new methods and ideas, thinking the unthinkable, connectedness of subjects, more than human subjects and matter, vibrancy and tendency of aesthetic self. Researchers still ponder how they should respond to the demise of Cartesian thinking and subject-object binaries, and how to work with and beyond the philosophy of the subject and the entanglements of the human non human or more than human world, and the threat of ecological, economic, and social crisis and threats that go along with it. As in, for example, New Zealand, early childhood education, bicultural Maori, Pakeha curriculum, the concern is how can different subjects, or human subjects, live well together with other subjects, places, and things. The concern remains how the humanist, omnipotent eye in education and arts research can be performed as a post-human eye and as a subject that's ethical, political, and in tune with the other subjects and objects, and that registers and moves in line with the agency of the non-human and material responding in reciprocal and responsive ways. Other aspects of new, other aspects of new materialist and post-humanist thinking and performances are perhaps less visible, yet perhaps more profound and differently substantial. The end of the pure rule of humanism and the depreciation of the human eye in education and arts-based research is, first and foremost, a message to all researchers and the structures that they have built, including research units and departments. And it is a message, years on, that we and our colleagues have not yet fully deciphered and comprehended. In its deepest sense, the end and the death of the human eye, the human subject, 
and the sheer ignorance of rational dominance over all non-human and material has, I argue, brought the major era in university research life to an end. It has also brought an end to modernity. The era of universities has been dominated by the culminating belief, expressed in different forms, that the university, and being as such, as a wholly no is a wholly knowable system governed by a finite number of universal laws and processes that qualitative researchers can grasp and rationally direct for their own benefit and conduct in discursive and non-material ways. This era, beginning in the Renaissance and developing from the Enlightenment to Socialism, from Positivism to Scientism, from the Industrial Revolution to the Information Revolution and Knowledge Economy, is characterized by rapid advances in rational, cognitive thinking, while embracing discursive or just romanticizing material, and it has produced the human eye as the center of all inquiry. While there are potentialities emerging, even perhaps burgeoning pockets of challenge of the human, of the human subject and I, it is still the human eye and the subject that pursues his researchers' daily being in the university structures as in Baudrillard's hyperreality, and that makes us believe and desire as it can offer more, more, more reality than nature can. Havel's ideas about victims, supporters, and rebel subject positions present an interesting challenge to the human eye, but we still remain university-funded, grounded human subjects, persuading the hierarchy for promotion and tenure tracks, striving for funding. Such ideas gave rise to the proud belief that vice chancellors, university presidents, and deans, professors, as the pinnacle of everything that exists in universities, were capable of objectively describing, explaining, and controlling everything that occurs, and each of them possessing the one and only truth about the world and the human eye, an era where there was a cult of depersonalized objectivity, an era in which objective knowledge was amassed and technologically exploited, an era of belief on, of automatic progress brokered by the scientific method. There was an era of systems, institutions, mechanisms, and statistical averages. There was an era of freely transferable, existentially ungrounded information and knowledges. There was an era of ideologies, doctrines, interpretation of reality, an era where the goal was to find a universal theory of the world and of universities with the human eye in its center, and thus a universal key to unlock the path to prosperity. That was all an era of the human eye. The human eye project was an attempt on the basis of few propositions masquerading as the only scientific truth to organize all of life according to a single model and a single subject that's central in planning and control regardless of whether or not that's what the life wanted. The post-human eye can thus be regarded as a sign that modern thought based on the premise that the world is objectively knowable by the human eye, solo and alone, and that the knowledge so obtained can be absolutely generalized, has come to a final crisis. The human eye has produced the illusion of the very first global or planetary technological civilization, but it has reached the limit of its potential, the point beyond which the abyss begins. The birth of the post-human eye is a single that the era of an arrogant, absolute reason is never here to last. So where has the human eye lead us? It has allowed us to destroy the fragile ecosystem of our planet. The large paradox at the moment is that the human subject with the central eye, the great collector of information and knowledge, is absolutely incapable of dealing with the Anthropocene as a traditional science with its usual coolness can describe the different ways we might destroy ourselves, but it cannot offer the human eye truly effective and practicable instructions on how to avert them. The human subjects and the human eye, proud of having used impersonal reasons to release a, gene, a giant genie from its bottle, are now impersonally distressed that they can't drive it back into the bottle again. There have been attempts to reproduce the human eye, as it is rewritten and reshaped many times. However, human subjects and the eye are employing the same means used to unleash it in the first place searching for new scientific recipes, new ideologies, new control systems, new institutions, new instruments to eliminate the dreadful consequences of the previous recipes, ideologies, control systems, institutions, and instruments. The human eye treats the fatal consequences of technology 
as though they were a technical effect that could be remedied by technology alone. The human eye searches for an objective way out of the crisis of objectivism. The human eye cannot devise within the traditional modern attitude to reality a system that will eliminate all the disastrous consequences of previous systems. The human eye cannot discover law, theory, or policy where technical application will eliminate all the disastrous consequences of all the technical application of earlier laws, technologies, and policies. The human eye will need to abandon the arrogant belief that the world and its ecosystem is merely a puzzle to be solved, a machine with instructions for use waiting to be discovered, a body of information and knowledge to be fed into a university computer in the hope that sooner or later it will spit out the universal solution of continuation, progression, and prosperity. So in the writing and post human eye and conducting this genealogical exercise of the human eye, it becomes clear that's, that the human eye is something more than a mere body of information and knowledges that can be externally grasped and objectified and mechanically assembled. And now I will turn into the idea, as often my thinking, into fairy tales and ideas to try to demonstrate some of this thinking. Stories such as Pinocchio Little Otik emphasize the ideas of viber meta, relational practice, and the connectedness of human subjects, not human subjects, and objects. In the stories and fairy tales, it's no longer clear who is a subject and who is the other and who is an object, as objects turn into subjects with particular subject positions. For example, Pinocchio's wooden nose performs a vibrancy of meta. It becomes longer and longer when he's lying or under stress. The wooden toy has subject subjectivities that under traditional paradigms are assigned only to the human eye. It's also, it's a toy, it's, it's a toy born out of agency and connectedness between subjects and objects. And so it happens in the story of Little Otik, a tree stump in the forest that resembles, which means looks like, feels like, has a vibrancy of little baby once brought home and cleaned up by human subjects becoming parents who could not conceive a child, it is named Little Otik and is treated like a real baby, a real human subject. Both Pinocchio and Little Otik characters perform the vibrancy of matter, the agency of the inorganic, how matter impacts upon matter. They shift the human eye into a position that evokes key for things for the planet as a connectedness in a time of Anthropocene. These stories are perhaps fantasies that adult human subjects accept as a fairy tale. However, children take seriously the call for vibrancy, thinghood, subjectivity, and plasticity of matter, and they become real in a play space in the corners of the kindergarten outside of the gaze of adults. In a time of Anthropocene, perhaps only subjects with human eye who are looking for a technical trick to save that romanticized planet need to feel despair but those who believe in our modesty, in the power of their own post-human being, performed by the subjectivities and agency towards other subjects and objects, which mediates between the human subject, modern human subjects and object positionings, have no reason to despair at all. So, now we will look at the generating of data. In the, in the spirit of the Czech philosopher Havel, he has persuasively developed the thought that the rational spirit of modern science that determines a traditional view on and of data is founded on abstract reason and on the presumption of impersonal objectivity and has its conceptual tradition not only in the natural science like Galileo, but also in politics or ideology, namely Machiavelli. And indeed it was Machiavelli who first formulated, albeit with an undertone of malicious irony, a the theory of politics is a rational technology of power that determines the way we consider, crave, think, portray, collect, store, and fund data. Despite all the potential and complex historical detours, the origin of modern political power and the idea of data may be sought and traced be precisely here, that is, once again in a moment when human reason begins to liberate itself from the human being as such, meaning from pers personal experience, personal conscience, and personal responsibility. Just as the modern scientists set apart the actual human being as the subject of the lived experiences of the world, so ever more evidently do both the modern state and modern politics 
and subsequent data that justify and provide evidence-based inquiry to it. To interrogate data episteme, philosophy as a method is helpful to rethink and re-theorize the natures and ontologies of data regimes. Philosophy as a method has become pronounced in a recent turn in post-qualitative thinking. Through different ontological perspectives on data regimes, the attempt here is to provoke shifts in epistemological thought about data that allow data to become, in a sense, both as a discursive and as a meta, as the thought and the embodiment of sensations, effects, and aesthetics. Such thinking is to contest data regimes as both a cultural and metaphysical construct. Data regimes then become imbued with the vitality and the capacity, and it removes ontological hierarchies of thought about data regimes, while at the same time urging us to constantly rethink and negotiate them. The challenge is take on the challenge posted by opening up data using philosophy as a method and as an orientation and attitudes towards thought to offer an alternative ethical reading of data regimes. Recently, there has been what could be seen as a rediscovery or an, um, of materialist scholarship in a turn to new materialisms, new empiricism, post-humanisms, speculative realism, and many others. I purposefully situate data within the embrace of philosophical thinking about discourse and matter alike to provoke and challenge established ways of thinking about data regimes, including those about the perpetuation of inequalities and about the still prevalent and worrying homogenization of data. Philosophy as a method offers a theorization of spaces for the essentializing data. Using philosophy as a method is to challenge the timing of data, episteme of data as linear predetermined occurrences, as it foregrounds ontological, ethical, and political notions. It fuels the provocations that drive us to rethink how data are conceptualized and dissected, distinguished, and timed. There is a need for a new readings of data episteme. Issues and tensions within contemporary ontologies of data persuading this argument. They emerge from a context that is deeply concerning and that needs exploring as an entry point for developing perhaps more speculative narrative of data. Some time ago, the hegemony of empirical studies of data started to crack and eventually crumbled, taking a singular construct of data with its, in its fall. As cracks and crevices became evident in the crumbling consistency of known thought and practice, in the field of these data methodologies, scholars were increasingly confronted with the far-reaching questions and great challenges that the opening up of these new ontologies of data generated. Still, there remains a lack of engagement with these developments in terms of confronting and rethinking what the deviation from previous conceptions means for ontologies of data. Um, with a um, lot of scholars from Finland and from Scandinavia, we have done a data book with Mirka Korlundberg and Taya Leutonen, and um, that completed to begin and dissect what might be the, at the roots of this reluctance. And this paper elaborates on some of these notions that's trying to challenge and that arises from challenging the singularity of data. The dominant discourses when these ontologies of data are seen as purely empiric demand a rethinking of data regimes. Contextualizing contemporary local and global societies they require us to defend and provoke conceptualizing data as imbued with a multiplicity of values to advance and elevate the presence and impact of otherness amongst the branches of methodological thinking. It was this recognition of the limiting notions of requiring proofs and evidence that became the driving force of the so-called unification of the West in terms of holistic and data-focused thinking. Further. If we were to speculate, this recognition led to a paradigm that perhaps it's not universally embraced, but that all accept as a possibility. In other words, it is the face of hegemonic approaches to empirical data collection, coding, analysis, representation, and dissatisfaction with ideologies of oppression that have driven scholars in the West in various ways to rethink data episteme. In thinking with data, I do wonder about the place within such a rethinking of critical engagement with an understanding of these ontologies. In a sense then, dominant Western scholarship 
has arguably accepted the dominant stance that united it, and it has continued to perform what was necessary to maintain its cohesiveness, that is a focus on singular constructions of data and big data and dominance of human subjects in relations, practice, ethics alike. So, one evening, not so long ago, I was sitting on a patio in a restaurant by the water. My table and chair I was sitting on was almost identical to the chairs and tables next to me and to those that they have in other restaurants. My senses were transmitting the hard problem of the reality while the radio blasted some kitsch melody pop rock music that they play in most eateries like this. I saw familiar advertisements on the walls and the bathroom looked the same with its traditional male demeanor. Above all, I was surrounded by young people who were similarly dressed, who drank familiar looking drinks and who behaved in casually as their contemporaries elsewhere. But somehow in this boredom of sameness and everydayness was the center of my hard problem of merging empiric humanly shaped objects of this boredom and the discursive strife for adventure of shapes, colors, and stories. There suddenly emerged a need for different methodologies and philosophies that could puncture the ability to reveal and name all the events and objects in my limited scope of vision and abilities to utilize my intellect to name everything. I pondered through these methodologies that I could not give a name to, through these unnamed philosophies, as the sameness and language approached me from each corner, fashion, interaction, and face, data. I was there sitting and thinking about these unnamed empiric and discursive openings over and over again, till I came across the thought that we now live in a single global civilization. The attempt is, of course, neither banal nor true. The identity of our civilization does not conceive itself through merely a landscape of similar objects, forms of dresses, similar drinks, or in constant buzz of the same commercial music all around us, or even in international advertising, or our understanding of demeanors of male washrooms. It lies perhaps in something deeper, and thanks to the ruins of modernity, the idea of constant progress with its inherent expansionism and to the rapid evolution of science that comes both directly and in indirectly with it, our planet that we call home has, for the first time in the long history of humans, been covered in the time and space for very few decades by a single civilization, one that has become essentially technological. And when determining technological civilization, comes the need for different methodologies and philosophies of no name to understand, to respect, and finally perhaps to enjoy it. What this technological civilization that can be assigned as a real world means is that it is now enmeshed in real, hard narratives of algorithms and networks that can take up billions of tiny threads or capillaries. These units transmit information between intrahumans interhumans and intraspecies at a lightning speed, but also convey integrated models of social, political, and economic behavior. They are conduits for legal norms, as well as for billions and billions of dollars appearing and disappearing discursively and empirically around the world while most likely remaining invisible, even to those who deal directly with them. In current times, still driven by the remains of modernity, our, what we could refer to as the global civilizations of human, give human and non-human entities not only the capacity for worldwide communication, but also, in an idealistic sense, a coordinated means of defending themselves against many common dangers. There is a source of danger that threatens humans in spite of this global civilization, and often directly because of it. Partly, it's because the methodology and philosophy of our inquiry has a very clear name, a human name. This has been the case for centuries, of philosophical ponderings and related methodologies. This naming is at the heart of many disciplines and at the very core of human existence and ruling of everything that we can name, all human and non-human entities. Many of the concerns that we as humans face today, as far as I can understand and articulate them, have their origin in the very idea that our global civilization, through its in evidence everywhere, is no more than a thin veneer over the sum total of human awareness, this limited scope. Naming the relevant methodologies and philosophies not only allows this limitation, but pushes it right through the center of our inquiry. 
So philosophy as a method is an ontological, epistemological, and ethical relationship with the thought. This methodology carries theories and thoughts into practices, questions each and every ontology, and uproots established epistemologies. Philosophy as a method remains one of the methodologies that has the potential of not being named, and it covers a vast territory of thinking and methods. Philosophy as a method has diverse epistemological and ontological commitments, and they are not linear or compatible with each other. How can not naming a methodology and philosophy deteriorize arts and educational spaces? Through the history of humankind, methodologies and philosophies have become an entrapment that has desynthesized, if not paralyzed, thinkers, researchers, and teachers. Numerous classical examples demonstrate how philosophy was used as a method, ranging from Plato to Aristotle, and more in modern philosophy. How do theories and philosophies enter practice? How do methodologies gain their traction? How does the thinking, doing of philosophy as a method influence the education and art research space then and now? If philosophy as a method were to remain unnamed, there would be multiplicities and non-singular conceptualizations and performances of this method. Not to name a methodology or philosophy does not need to be sign of ignorance, but an ability to think the unthinkable, to play with the temporalities and space, and allowing the notions of continuous thinking and doing philosophy to take place. There are some that argue that humankind is immensely fresh and young, and because of this newness, also very fragile. The human-centric thinking and philosophy and relevant methodologies have accepted this with dizzling electricity, without the notion that this should be the grounding in itself for changing our being and doing in any substantial way. So, while the world as a whole increasingly embraces the new habits of global civilization, another contradictory process is taking place. Ancient traditions and practices are reviving. Different thoughts, religions, and cultures are awakening to new ways of being and struggling with growing fervor to realize what is unique to them and more makes them different from others. Ultimately, they seek to give their individuality something that they can refer to as a call for political expression and as a search for legitimization of their philosophies and methodologies without any name. For example, how many posts and new turns does it take to persuade local tribes that using a proper name to the methodology is a useful, important, and the correct pathway to take. Apparently, in the beginning was the world, and in other words, the Euro-American white male-centric world has equipped other parts of the globe with instruments and methodologies with proper names that not only could effectively destroy the important values, stories, and secrets, which, among other things, made possible the invention of precisely these instruments and methodologies, but which could very well cripple the human capacity to engage with other human and non-human entities. Methodologies and philosophies with no name pose a clear challenge, not only to the human-centric world, but to all other than human and non-human entities and agencies alike. There is a challenge that we, humans, do need to start understanding. And perhaps the meaning of naming philosophies and methodologies may not make any sense, and its purpose might not lie in undermining the individuality of different spheres of methodologies and philosophies, but in allowing methodologies without the proper name to be more complete in themselves. However, this will not be possible and conceivable if we as a humans accept a basic code of mutual coexistence with other than human philosophies, a kind of common minimum onto episto ethical grounding that we can all share together one that will perhaps enable us to go on living side by side, named or unnamed. Yet such a code will not stand a chance and will not make any sense if it is merely the product of a few and then proceed to force it, advertise it, push it, and preach it on the rest. And most likely, give it a name. It's merely disseminated through the capillaries and the epidermis of the skin, like the way current ads are as a commodity covered by some to others such a code can hardly be expected to take hold in any profound way for anyone. But perhaps we have no capacity to fulfill such an undertaking, and maybe it's a hopelessly utopian idea. 
Perhaps we have lost the believed control in, of our heritage of named philosophies and methodologies, and how we are condemned of gradual extension in ever harsher high-tech clashes between methodologies and philosophies with names. Perhaps it is our fatal inability to cooperate in the face of impending problems and career-driven realities where ethics is admired, but privately smirked upon as a silly and affordable and only at the highest level of the slow academic climb. However, I have not lost hope that there is a case for not named philosophies and methodologies, because there are ideas lying dormant in the deepest roots of most humans and non-humans alike. And there seems to be growing interest and for some a real need to take a planetary outlook rather than a human-centric one, a genuinely important starting point for the new code of human, non-human coexistence will be firmly anchored in the great diversity of human, non-human traditions and performances. In our era, it would seem that one part of methodologies and philosophies, the rational part which has made all these morally neutral discoveries and has a proper names, has undergone exceptional development, while the other part, we should be alert to ensure that these discoveries really do serve all humans and non-humans and will not destroy them is lagging behind catastrophically. Perhaps it is our responsibility to protect the methodologies with no name, rather than naming them, exposing them, and categorizing and analyzing them. Perhaps there is a need for radical renewal of methodological responsibility, of not wanting to discover and turn every stone, whether for curiosity or for academic profit. In order to do so, we must divest ourselves of our egotistical anthropocentrism, of our deep methodological and philosophical habits of seeing ourselves as those who rule philosophy, methodology, and the universe. Perhaps we need instead a humble respect of any kind of methodology and philosophy with no name. So how did we, so how did we get here? And this thinking starts at the thought about the exemplar and what an exemplar might look like and what is its purpose. Are data an exemplar? And if it is of what? I'm perhaps troubled by what Masumi argues in his work, as I quote, every example harbors the terrible powers of deviation and aggression. Masumi, quote, leads me to negotiate the Lusian thinking, the cinema, the film, the movie, the clip, as not a set still of pictures that is glued by a certain progression and succession, but to start thinking about this movement, movement inside and movement outside, the motion, the movement, what moves, what does not move, what is still, but also move. The stories of inside, the stories of inside and outside are brought together through the motions and the motions of power that they are subjected to, and they intersect as Havel argues, as the exercise of power is determined by thousands of interactions between the world of the powerful and that of the powerless. All the more so because these worlds were never divided by a sharp line. Everyone has a small part of himself in both. But how to link this, but how to link these motions of power to the ideas of the body, particularly a child's body, and what this body experiences? How does the child's experience influence us, push us, place us in stages of becoming? What happens to us when we see, feel, experience these instances of anomalies, of movement, within the stories about the child, childhood, ecology, and disaster? What alternative thinking happens? Does it do to us something inside or outside or both? Is it something discursive that we are able to conceptualize? rethink, reimagine, re-territorialize? Or is it something that happens physically, viscerally, almost an act of violence, something that appears on our body, like an inscription of the skin, remapping of the world, materially rethinking our discursive map, rediscovering the flat world, the world as a cultural and spatial icon, flattened on our skin, feeling it as it's bruising us, just as data can bruise us. What Masumi argues is, when I think of my body and I ask what it does to earn that name, two things stand out. It moves, it feels. In fact, it does both at the same time. It moves as it feels, and it feels itself moving. Can we think of body without this? 
an intrinsic connection between movement and sensation whereby each immediately summons each other. What movement as a methodology does to me is that it presents an alternative story of Deleuze's project in the becoming movement of philosophy and becoming a moving subject. In my reading of Deleuze, I feel and think, I touch and hear and embrace the interconnectedness of human and non-human alike. I trace the relationships of living together, sharing the play space, the planet, and impacting upon each other with each other. In Deleuzean thinking, movement as a methodology is just a flowing matter. Movement does become an image of a movie. The mundane slices and frames, images of the state of becoming, the mundane, the everyday, grey movements, inside, outside, they are produced as barely visible and often overlooked. Their grayness lies in the invisibility of their performance, positioned in the cracks between the extreme examples of the governance. These everyday movements may be often unattractive for the researchers and uncomfortable for those who live them. Everyday, mundane childhoods are central to our lives. However, their nature often remains unheard and unspoken, out of the limelight of the public discourse. So cutting and pasting slices of these everyday movements and reframing and re-slicing and reimagining are all parts of the methodology of movement. The movement the images, the perception of movement of the mundane everyday of the gaze. Methodology as of movement, as Deleuze would perhaps argue, provides us with infinitive potential, recombinations of our world with entities and our images of both organic and inorganic. In the movement as methodology, both subjects and objects can be infinitely divided and redivided. For the loose, as I quote, cinema is the practice of world dividing and redividing. The more intricate the relations, the more variety of ways we can relate and re-relate to our world. Cinema on screen can help us to see new ways to view our world. It re-articulates the world, and in doing so, shows us potentially new ways to live life. For life and cinema are two sides of the same. Cinema is life, and life is cinema. There is this notion of transformation of the subject, the assemblage before the production of other subject, and how public resistance work. Every day who steps out of the line, denies in its principle, and threatens the order in its entirety. It is utterly unimportant how large space this alternative occupies. Its power does not consist in its physical attributes, but in the light it casts on those pillars of the system and its unstable foundations. So I asked this question of my students studying to become early years teachers. At the end of the course, I asked them in terms to draw and create their ideal, desired early childhood educational setting with an inside, outside area. I was not aware that I had asked them to become architects of panopticons. They drew and modeled the ideal settings, and as they were doing so, they separated, segregated, confined, and categorized imaginary teachers and children in their model. They planned their movements, timetabled, and created observable places and spaces. The spatiality of the designed outdoors and indoors area emphasized the notion of visibility. There was no space for secrets, resistance, denying, or exposing anything subversive. These were the very things that were supposed to be removed by such visibility. In this panopticon, the architects, the future teachers, were molding childhood skills, abilities, and capacities. These spaces were normalizing, and through high visibility, producing places and spaces where a series of commands and practices are learned to change from routine to routine and to enable mass participation and obedience. The students also worked with matter in organic materials as architects. Matter was in, in, integral in considering this panopticon and the surface feel vibrancy of thinghoods influenced students' decisions about how, many, how they impact on children and teachers and how these subjects as teachers impact upon the matter things in the setting. The power relations in this panopticon as constructed by the students, aimed at disciplining both subjects and matter alike, and making sure that the subject shapes subjects, matter shapes subjects, subject shape matter, and finally, that matter shapes matter. The concerns with the student architects of the panopticons 
is that they were concerned with visibility, politics of power, and the production of the ideal panopticon and policies and regulations, rather than being concerned with aesthetics, effect, beauty, and subject thinghood's relations. So the images are not the artifacts, but deterrizing and reterrorizing forces working in the assemblage with the viewer becoming different in order to disrupt the dominant discourses of movement. Jane Bennett argues that matter is not passive, but it is active and therefore productive in nature, or as she argues, vibrant. Traditionally, matter is a form that science has prescribed as something objective. We can observe it, we can touch it, we can play with it, we can feel it and work with it, and our senses can register it. Matter can be measured, evaluated, molded. Bennett argues that the dichotomy of things, matters, objects, and active, vibrant organisms and beings, similar to what Latour called actants, and this Latour's actance is anything that impacts and modifies another thing, and therefore changes its being behavior. In Bennett's thinking, she refers to this active process as vital materiality. Bennett also traces notions of material vitalism in the Lucy's and Guattari's work as they viewed vitality as immanent in matter energy, and further explores how it can be found in their work on the intensities, becomings, and assemblages. Her aspiration, she writes, and I quote, is to articulate a vibrant materiality that runs alongside and inside humans to see how analysis of political events might change if we gave forces and things more due. New materialism shifts the center of attention to the non-human centered world of power and things. Things that speak to us as they have agency that is both political and ethical in nature. Bennett argues to take us that call for th for and of think seriously. Things have vitality and capacity. There is no ontological hierarchy in her thinking about matter and subjects, but there is an urge to cultivate a more careful attentiveness <coughs> to the outside. In the educational discourse, thinkers work with these notions, theories, and philosophies, and ask us qu such questions as Iris Dune does. What are the forces and forms that make a place? How does place work in current political and social economies? And as she argues, the concern is not to answer these questions, but to ask questions, to stimulate thought regarding the entanglements of self, matter, and place, as I called her. In a Deleuzean sense, meta becomes the embodiment of sensations, effects, and aesthetics. Bernard argues that the, and I quote, cultural forms are themselves powerful, material assemblages with resistant force, and for the active role of non-human material in public space. Duna in her other work argues that agency, and I quote, is no longer the expression of sovereignty or of an autonomous knowing self, but the seeking of encounters with vibrant matter that force continual invention to maintain the relation between movement and rest. Thus, the post-humanism and new materialism is a vast range of diverse approaches and an intricate, distinctive, and nuanced web of disciplines, thinking and being that's political, onto-epistemological, but mostly ethical in nature, and we need to trace it back all the way to the philosophy. The idea of movement thereby transforms into a physical play movement in space. In the depth of the spirit of the philosophy as a method, is there is such a thing, I seek to find a faithful ambivalence on the one hand, a spectacular advance of rational knowledge, accompanied by a growing respect for the ethics of data. And on the other hand, the data rights and data ontologies, and most importantly, to question data inherent expansionism while enjoying the curious playfulness of data that never seems to stop. Thank you so much. to think or, <laughs> or <laughs> if anyone has a question ready coming please yes and please introduce yourself when so we get to know yes hello thank you very much for your uh, fascinating talk my name is Mira Kalia Taving I'm a professor of arts based research and pedagogy in the university at uh, the university 
uh, yeah, I, I was uh, wondering, asking you a question. Uh, it's, by the way, not my phone. Please. <laughs> uh, a question that I think my... <laughs> thanks. I think my students would like to, so th those, of the, uh, who, those who are not here would mm. probably like to ask, uh, mm. uh, who are very much engaged uh, with artistic research mm. And, mm. and the word mm. uh, of data seems to be mm. problematic. Mm. So I was mm. just thinking about this mm. uh, idea of uh, new ontologies of data mm. and thinking about the, mm. uh, not mm. naming, uh, mm. how, how you feel mm. about like in mm. when thinking about the post qualitative research mm. and mm. Uh, the whole concept of data mm. is it uh, mm. still something that we need in this mm. this mm. type of thinking mm. it's a very good question and then thank you for it and uh, um, I think um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hide that I consider concept of data very problematic and I think I hope that came across in this um, in this talk that uh, what we need to do in my in my perspective is to trace the history of data all the way back to the human eye project and to understand why we actually need data and what data are but I also think that um, the concept of data is um, is very useful because it's always very useful to be able to uh, to, to understand where we came from. So I wouldn't completely abandon the notion of data, but I would feel very open to reconceptualize what data is. And I think that's what um, um, Mirka Kolunberg and Thea Leutinen and, uh, and I were trying to do in, uh, in the book about data, about data uh, in qualitative inquiry, where we try to think of what data actually could be in both education and artistic space and research. I have read the book. Yes, yes. So, so you know, so we try to sort yeah. of, it, it ranges from hard data all the way to data perhaps being a ghost of a, of a dead grandmother or data being the snow, data being uh, various objects, thoughts, uh, um, something that, that, that came to our life and disappeared. And But I think that abandoning completely data can be quite dangerous because uh, there, is, uh, there is something inherent in, uh, as I try to try through this paper, in a human capacity and ability to, to work with something real and something that you can touch and that you can feel and that you can have. It's very, it's, it's very comforting to have data. Abandoning the concept of data can be extremely dangerous, and uh, and can be uh, and I would I, and I would argue. And the way when we were working on a book, we were thinking that well, if you completely abandon the notion of data, what can happen is you can you can really become part of the process and uh, become really lost. And while there is not a problem to be lost within the research, there is a problem with us having enough knowledge and enough uh, episteme with respect to reading of the relevant text that would trace us back to understanding of how did we get to the point that we lost for us to utilize. I don't know if it makes sense. But basically what I'm trying to say is that uh, um, we need to reconceptualize data and use various notions of data, but abandoning the notion of data fully, mm -hmm. I, would be, I would consider to be problematic. Thank you. Yeah. Also, uh, in your opinion, what would like posthuman school mm. look like? Yeah, ideally, what posthuman school? Posthuman school or education? Yes. You know, you know, we move to this kind of posthuman era, yes. and you know, we have schools. So yes. What the, those institutions would like look like, and what? Yes. Place. You mean posthuman school as a school, as a universe, as a department of yeah, school, as a, like a school, school of thought? Or kindergarten, so. Okay, schools. Yeah. Okay, as a, as a spaces, as a institutions. Okay. Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, 
Um, I think what I try to what I try to do in this in this paper is to really think how did we get here to this current thinking of the Bosunism, and I try to demonstrate both with the quotes and with utilizing traditional philosophy to really understand how did we get with the idea of naming and naming philosophies and, and philosophers to the current um, problem, something that I would refer as a hard problem, hard problem of a naming, whether it's a naming of data or whether it's a naming of um, approaches or school of thoughts. And, um, and I have to say, I, I struggle to, to, to give too much power to one approach in the sense that post-human approach is, um, is, is not something new. It's been around for many years, and, uh, and uh, those of you who, who read philosophy, you know, if you trace it to the third book of Ethics of Spinoza, um, where it's very clear, you know, what stands from Conatus and how, 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 um, how subjects relate to each other and what's the relationship between subject and object, that's, uh, that's a very powerful thought. However, at the moment, in a, as we are right now in the past, that we call 10, 15 years, we have become really uh, impressed and exposed to a lot of scholarships that cause itself post human and new materials. And uh, as with other approaches in the past, it became very, uh, um, it became very traditional, so to speak, that they should influence not only theoretical thinking, but also practice. So they should have some practical implication. So coming back to Spinoza, for example, Spinoza denied in any way or rejected the idea that, uh, that philosophy should be, as an, in an axiological sense, which means combination of ethics and aesthetics, that it should have any kind of uh, uh, morals or any kind of impact upon beings other than being a practical philosophy that means lived experience. And in that sense, if I take posthumanism as something that stands all the way back to you know, this kind of Dutch Jewish heritage, I would sort of, I would struggle to think that we should have a schools or institution where we educate children in, in particular sense, because it would go, in my opinion, against the whole sense of being uh, posthumanism. Posthumanism for me is part of philosophy as a method. That means it is part of this ethical relationship with the thought and, uh, and um, labeling and naming a school post-human school would would um, would create a um, lot of academics may get really excited and 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 a lot of parents really confused <laughs> and uh, what it actually means. Uh, I also have to say that the prefix post is very interesting, and uh, I try to touch upon the whole prefixes of uh, of post and new and all these kind of things that we attach to various. Uh, various um, movements. Uh, prefix post, for me, doesn't mean that the era is long gone and we are in something post. Post-humanism, for me, is that we're carrying that heritage and that baggage and all those uh, terrible uh, things that happen in the name of human-centric and, and humanism, which should be really, if you read the philosophy, really wonderful, but we know how in practice it led to the uh, very strong both human-centric and human exceptionalism and uh, the whole ruins of modernity we still feel in our everyday practice. So post-human school could be itself a really liberating space. I, I, I do would agree with it. However, I would really struggle with uh, Sending my three months old child there, so. Uh, <laughs> I am Anne Vassila from the University of uh, Lappeenranta, huh. Technological University, and also been uh, involved in a technological context yes. yeah. in this art space research. So, my question <laughs> is very, very practical. I'm very curious yes. about uh, the practical inquiries mm. you have been doing with in your study mm. with children. Mm. How all these beautiful things, what you are philosophically sort of a 
sketching for us? How does it, uh, how does it implement in action? Mm. W- what it is in mm. action? Mm. What do you mm. do when you organize inquiries with children? Yeah. So I'm a philosopher of education. So I stay in the beautiful place that you described, <laughs> mostly. But, um, but that's not necessarily fear because I'm also a teacher and I'm a practicing and registered teacher. And uh, so I do a little bit of both. But I think that this is a very good question. It's a very, very good question. And I think that um, what happens when you, um, when you are with, there, there is something very special that happens. And I'm going to talk about kindergarten space because I'm traditionally early childhood teacher and uh, <coughs> spend a lot of time in, uh, in kindergartens. Um, this thinking about um, new thinking around data and these ideas about discourse and matter on um, as something that um, not separated with in that kind of Cartesian thinking as, as, as dominated the modernity is something that is very visible when you are with children because we talked about it today with um, some with Eva master students actually when we when we discuss the um, the idea of children, an idea of childhood, for example, the idea of uh, children as uh, human beings with, with with real bodies that they move, they run, they 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 are real, and there is no way we can we can argue that they are discursive. And at the hand, we talked about the childhood as something that's very much discursive, and now. We tend to use these terms interchangeably sometimes, children and childhood. Um, a lot of people would, uh, would argue that, uh, that uh, children are physical beings and childhood is a construct that's been sort of uh, uh, discovered or elevated or become prevalent. But now that you're in early childhood space and you observe both, for example, children and childhood and you observe them interact with objects, suddenly you can see the uh, how this mixture creates this energy, this power of the inorganic, the power of the fiber matter. You see how things that are lying dormant and are just there that you would, as an adult, walk over, they become alive in children's hands. They become subject. Suddenly, the subject-object binary that philosophy has worked for centuries and centuries has become very permeable. Suddenly subjects become objects and objects become subjects in this kind of place. And for me, learning this with children and understanding what it means not to be a human-centric being where the knowledge that it's inside me can help me to understand myself and the whole world around me, but rather is based upon the relationships and the relationality between me as a subject and all the other subjects and objects alike, how there is an agency not only in subjects but also in objects, and how they relate, how they speak, how they act. That's something very powerful, and that's something that I get from childhood, early childhood research, and that's where I see this uh, thinking coming really together um, the other example that I would use is that um, working with uh, teachers and uh, in teacher education, I mean, many of you, I assume, are in teacher education or in educating students. Um, we often rely upon the notion of reflection. Reflection is a powerful tool. So we often ask the, uh, our you know, teachers or students in the class to reflect upon what they've done. We ask them to read something, give them exemplar, like for example, I showed Masumi's work there, and we ask them to reflect upon what happened. And uh, what this reflection means, and why is this reflection problematic in a human centric tradition, and while in post human way of thinking about this, it is something that we can reconceptualize. If you ask a student to reflect on something, you're asking them to utilize their inner self, their notion of introspection, they idea that they, with their own knowledge and cognition, never think what they have, they can understand what actually happened, they can interpret it, utilize it, use it, extrapolate it, 
and later on perform it. However, if you think about a uh, human way of thinking, you saying you actually cannot do it without relationality with other subjects and objects. The knowledge that you have on your own is simply not sufficient in that way. So it's a very simplified way of sort of looking at it. But basically, it's quite important because reflection and reflective practice has been so dominant and so uh, colonizing our practice in, 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 in universities where we constantly asking individual human subjects to be the knowers of the whole space and universe and rule it and, uh, and, and perform it. And I would say that post-human post -human thinking or thinking where we can trace these ideas of uh, relational self rather than self-knowing self can be extremely productive and really important and produce a different space in uh, our universities or educational spaces per se. So that would be one, that would be second perhaps example. Uh, I don't know if it answers your uh, question, but... Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Time for a couple more questions. I would just welcome some comments or some yeah, ideas comments, from yes, what, what you're and working you on and what you're doing. Uh, hello, my name is David Juvansan. I'm an affiliated researcher here. Mm. And actually, I would just to share yes. a comment um, about my own experience as a child. Yes. That Actually, my, my, my problem is was not with childhood, in becoming adult, in the sense that uh, I'm Italian origin, was born uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, in a neighborhood with Italians and Spanish. And let's say the question of the issue of nationality or identity was not at all an issue. We were say Italian, Spanish, in Switzerland, talking French among each other, but still relating to either Italy or Spain. And it was totally normal to start a sentence in French and finish in Italian or with Spanish words. And it was very fluid, let's say. And then the moment where I kind of became adult and people were asking me, so who are you, where are you from? <laughs> that became traumatizing because I, it was impossible for me to say like uh, and then for Swiss people I was Italian but for Italians I was Swiss so it was even more uh, traumatizing so I've, maybe the, the issue is not so much with children but more with adults how they are not able to handle this fluid attitude of children mm. Mm. yes and and uh, we are here just adults talking about children it's an uh, that's also very, very concerning. We, uh, um, we rarely, uh, um, its practices are changing, but often, uh, often we end up, um, a lot of teacher educators, early childhood, uh, or people are focused on children and childhood, they end up together in uh, big conferences and spaces talking about children and childhood. And, and there is a lot of uh, ethics involved about uh, um, extracting data, whatever data is, extracting data and bringing it to conferences and presenting it and sharing it and then coming back and uh, and it's, I, I, I would agree, I would agree, I don't know if adults are a problem but I would agree that a um, lot, of, lot of problems start once you become adult and uh, particularly, um, particularly and, and again we talked about it already today but one thing that we talked about earlier today is that um, there is there seems to be in a contemporary society this uh, um, this debate or this tension between um, what we want of of our children whether we want uh, we focused on their whether we focus on them as beings or whether we focus on their uh, of them becoming someone and uh, now I don't mean notion of becoming in the Lusian sense now, I mean the notion of becoming in a way that uh, all the practices and schooling and areas that we focus on is, we focus on the children, who the child's going to be when they are finally ontologically complete and they reach adulthood as a full maturity. 
So we are fully focused on uh, creating environment for, for our children to um, to attend all the um, all the classes and special, and we drive them around the city to the best possible uh, places where they can gain best possible knowledge. Not because they want it right now, but we tell them that that's going to be very useful for you when you're going to be adult. You're going to be really find it useful. So the focus is on the notion of becoming who you're going to become, rather than the notion of being who the child is and who they are right now. And and that's and and that's very. Uh, uh, that, that's a big debate of that notion of the tension between being a child and becoming an adult in the future. And it seems that us adults, what we uh, sometimes, without any generalization, but sometimes what we really do for the best possible reasons and purposes is to, to really try to help and support our children of shaping them and, and providing them with best possible uh, both materials and, and, and uh, discursive knowledge to, to become someone in the future when they are fully complete. And, and, uh, and um, I'm thinking about it quite often. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a father of a three-month-old child, and I, and I think and I need to constantly stop myself thinking you know, that I really want him to be being and not becoming someone, but it's, uh, it's very difficult in a, in a society. So uh, that would be my, my comment to it. But, but I agree. It's... Uh, it's uh, there are a lot of tensions that happen once you, once you, once the rational and cognition kicks in, into uh, into need to name and categorize and and make sense which ethnicity and nation you belong to and which language is your real language, and which is your first language and not, and that that's where it comes perhaps something that we are I argue in this paper and what. Uh, what would we've been working in a in a field of post cognitive inquiry in that kind of idea of what if we would be not naming this philosophies and math theologies and and I went through part of my paper when I purposefully didn't name anything because I wanted to try to perform the way that uh, this not naming could work. Um, not naming means not to colonize, not to tame, and not to not to assign it particular characteristics, not to shape it and categorize it and place it into confined spaces and containers. We want to have, uh, in education and art spaces, we want to have a spillovers of both materials and discourses, not to contain them and name them and create the boundaries that this is supposed to be human, but if you're already here, this is still humanistic, and if you move there, that's already new materialism. And if you move here, there's a speculative realism. We, you, you want to have this constant fluid spillover of, of ideas, the same way perhaps as you talked about in the childhood, there was a very fluid and spillover of language as a sort of linguistic turn hits the child's development. You start a sentence in one sentence and finish in another and no one questions and asks you to clarify and categorize and name what you've done. But if it happens as if you would be adult, people would question you because you're supposed to be fully ontologically complete, rational adult being, right? So it's, uh, it's Yeah, I just uh, would like to ask yeah. another question or, sure. or maybe uh, yeah, kind please, of yeah. uh, develop your, yes. your yeah. thoughts. Uh, I, I recognize this yeah. idea of non-naming. Yes. I think it's uh, yeah. something that I would uh, also call kind of, uh, kind of uh, encountering questions of, uh, of uh, education and, yes. and uh, for me kind of uh, encountering the otherness and That's I, right. would, I would definitely yeah. like a, uh, respecting yes. that not knowing and, yes. and, and yes. brings me to think about uh, Levinas's work That's right. especially yeah. and yeah. so uh, do you see uh, my question is mm. that do mm. you see a paradox here uh, in terms of uh, thinking education mm. as a very, in my mind, very humanistic project, yeah. and and this idea of non naming and yes. the kind of uh, yes. thinking that ethics yes. is, according to Levinas yes. and many other yes. philosophers, yeah. hu only yes. for meant for humans. Yes. It's not meant yeah. for non human animals, or yes. it's not meant for objects or, yes. or materials. That's right. Yeah, I I I I, f I fully recognize that education is a very human eye, human centric mm -hmm. project that's been developed and uh, I think part of the way that we have as a 
as a humans is this kind of impossible task of uh, that we were um, perhaps in the past 10, 15 years we've been thrown into this arena of uh, suddenly this fluid thinking and post-human eye and what is post-human eye, how, how do you perform post-human eye, how do you deep write an eye, how do you conceptualize yourself without the human centric eye and it's almost impossible in an educational space and I think one of these ideas is for example the notion of reflection, I mean it's very complex but that's a very good example of how do you reflect without a human eye, how does the reflection happen which is one of the foundational sort of ways how ever since you know uh, the, um, the, um, the Roman times you know, reflection was part of who we were as a uh, human beings with respect to your so it is a very problematic and it's a very fluid concept with respect to your question about Levinas and ethics and a lot of philosophers it's, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right and, and I think that's why Spinoza fits quite well right there in the middle because Spinoza sort of is there between Descartes and Kant and sort of uh, they, 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 they disregarded him and moved on and we came back to him he was always a renegade of philosophy particularly because of his books of ethics that were you know I think it was published after he died, so there, there may have been some changes done by his students, but especially books one and two are fine, but books three is when it's going to become really interesting because that's where he challenges the established way of ethics, you know? That's where he brings the idea of, um, of ethics being something that's uh, quite axiological, which means both ethics and aesthetic, together. It also brings the idea that ethics is something that's uh, um, that you cannot really, that, that's supposed to be lived and, and performed and it's supposed to be something that um, is not only human centric, but it extends. And, and, and that's where I would go in my thinking. I, I, um, I wouldn't necessarily challenge Levinas on, on his thinking, but I, but I do understand and he, he was very strong in his ideas about um, ethical encounters, but um, for, for me personally, I see ethics as uh, something that's extendable to, to modern human and, uh, and objects. I don't think, I don't see it as something that uh, uh, needs to be only um, part of um, human eye project, so to speak. But uh, it's, an, it's something that's uh, that's been that's been contested, and uh, I come from a school of philosophy. So uh, when I when I talk with uh, uh, other philosophers of education, they very strongly disagree. They would they would argue that uh, while they are happy to assign some agency to other than human subjects and to uh, to uh, even to objects, they really struggle with ethics. They uh, um, that's something that's um, been in a philosophy determined as something that's very human centric quite strongly humanism yeah <laughs> that's right yeah. yeah yes yes thank you everybody thank you Marek I think it's time to close soon and um, to say that lots more to think this, these ideas and maybe hopefully you all, all can discuss with someone maybe with something <laughs> 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 these ideas and test, test yeah. if this is a possibility yeah. <laughs> and bring back some ideas to each other later yeah. thank you very much